we spent four weeks talking about developing a personal culture of worship. And I want to encourage you to expand your worship capacity. It's like building muscle. Okay? After uh, several months of not being able to exercise regularly because of stuff I was going through, uh, I started after the first of the year exercising again. And I was all the way down from 50 push-ups a day down to about 15. And I'm getting built back up again. It takes time to rebuild those muscles, right? The number of crunches that I'm doing and, and that to get, to get built back up, it just takes that time. And it's the same with worship. You have to build that spiritual muscle of worship. But the other thing we battle, we're in a sound bite culture. Don't you hate it when you're, when you're thinking in sound bites and, and you do something, oh, I got it, and then you have to go back and get something else. You get that and you go, oh, I got to go again. You got to run and get the third thing. Don't you just love that? <laughs> thinking in sound bites, you're going, I could have done all this in one trip if I'd have just thought of all of it in one time. And uh, it, it drives me crazy when I, when, when I do that. Worship. Worship is done today in sound bites by most people. It's because our whole culture is teaching us to think in sound bites. When you when when you're you're watching a television program and and it goes from sound bite to sound bite to sound bite. If you watch carefully at movies, the movies are changing scenes like this now. If, if you're like Wanda and I, and we love old classic movies, hallelujah. They're nice and progressive, and, and they make sense when they get done. <laughs> <clears throat> and, uh, but, it, but it's in sound bites today. And that is hindering our worship. And David shared a really, really important scripture when it says that God inhabits the praises of his people. So, so here's, here's my, little, my little teaser to you. If you are wanting to experience a greater measure of God's presence, learn to sustain your worship in a longer time frame. And, and I, I want to pre-warn you that you're going to find that our worship here at LFC is going to extend a little longer and a little longer. You know, we're, we're, we're going to try and build your spiritual muscle to that. But the whole reason for doing that, dear ones, is so that we can have a greater ministry of God's presence in our worship celebration. And that happens through worship. And uh, uh, I, I have been privileged to, 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 to live through three authentic revivals. I mean authentic. Uh, that went on for days and days and days. We had one that went on for 20 straight months. And it was common to... We, we started worship at 10.30. It was common to still be there at 1.30. Go home. Have dinner, rest a little bit, come back at 6 o'clock and go till 10 o'clock and sometimes 11 and midnight. And, and how was that possible? It wasn't labor. It, it, you were so in God's presence, you just didn't want to leave. And, and the worship was sustained at a level that it, it would take your breath more than one time, I've looked out, and, and we at that time were, were gathering uh, 400 people on Sunday morning. And I would look out, and our auditorium was fan-shaped. And there would be whole sections waving like wheat. And I thought, oh my goodness, the whole section's going to fall down. And we had concrete floors, so that would have been an experience. <laughs> but but we, it, it was not uncommon to have 20, 30 people slain in the altar on Sunday morning. In the presence of Almighty God. And it wasn't labored. It wasn't forced. 
It was because Almighty God was working. And I want to encourage you. You can have that in your personal life if you'll, if you'll develop that spiritual muscle to sustain a worship presence of the living God in, in your life. And just, just begin exercising that and go, you know what? Right now I'm worshiping three minutes, four minutes. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for six minutes and worship the Lord. And, uh, I remember when God first taught me this. He taught it to me first in prayer. And uh, I was a really young Christian. I was in high school. And I, and I would go to our, our midweek prayer meetings. And that's, that's when churches had midweek prayer meetings. And they really were prayer meetings. People didn't sit around and chat. They prayed. You know, they chatted, but they chatted to God. And, and we had old, old Brother Smith. And now, now okay, so I'm, I'm in high school, right? I'm a teenager. And, and Brother Smith was like old as Moses. You know, I mean, he was forever old. He's probably 60 or 70, probably my age, you know, that, uh, that he, he was forever old. And he could pray. He could pray. And, and there were times on Sunday morning when church service wasn't going real well that Pastor Chris Bullock would stop and he would go, Brother, pray for us. And I'll never forget, he would, he would kind of lean on the, on the back of the pew in front of him and he would go, oh, God. And it wasn't a put on holy voice. He would, oh, God. And about the third time he said that, you'd start getting goosebumps. It would just, I mean, God would just come in the building. And so hearing him pray at the prayer nights and those times on Sunday morning, I thought, that's how you got to pray if you're really going to get a hold of God. And I said, God, I'm going to pray an hour. And I got down and I, oh, God. And can you imagine a teenage voice trying to do that? Oh, God. You know, and, and I, oh, God. And I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. Man, did I pray. And I knew it had been an hour. I looked at the clock. It had been four minutes. <laughs> looked at it, I thought, I will never get an hour. <laughs> I'm going to go for it. So I, went, I did, I did, and I did it again. And I went, and I went, and I went on, and on, and on, and on. And I knew, man, I got done. I prayed for everything I could think of five times, you know. Well, not that often, but you know what I mean. And, and I looked at the clock, it had been ten minutes. <laughs> and I thought, how do you do that? You, you got to build your spiritual muscle to get there. You're not going to do it overnight. And that's why I'm encouraging you. Maybe you pray now for five minutes in the morning. Hey, really, try, try, try ten. Maybe, maybe you're worshiping God for fifteen minutes. Go for twenty. Build that spiritual muscle that will strengthen you. Okay, that was dessert. Now we're going to get down to the meat. You ready for the sermon? Okay. All right. <laughs> Mm. We, we discovered last week that Jesus had proclaimed his mission here on earth. And it was found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to proclaim deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. To set at liberty them that are bruised to proclaim the year of the Lord. Okay, this, this list behind me, that's what Jesus said his mission was. And we looked at it actually upside down last week because I wanted to start with the year of the Lord. Because he was talking about the year of Jubilee when all slaves go free and all debts are released. Because there was going to come a day when God would make it possible for all in slavery to sin and the powers of darkness to go free. And for all of their debts, all of their guilt, everything they had ever done wrong in their life to be forgiven. Amen? Amen. That year was coming. And they would never be held against them again. What an amazing thing. But God made that promise. In Micah, he said that God would put all of our sin in the sea. 
never to be held against us again. Wow, what a wonderful promise. And then that he would set at liberty the oppressed, that he would give recovery of sight to the blind. He would set at liberty the captive. He would heal the brokenhearted. And he would preach the gospel to the poor. And and we, we discovered that it's not just talking about financially poor, but there is a much greater poverty than a financial poverty. And that is the spiritual poverty that we can't do anything about. And even the very word that Jesus used for the poor, both there and in Matthew chapter 5, it's the Greek word that means they are so poor that they have no means or capacity for changing their poverty. It's like the man living on the street that has no hands and no feet and can't do anything about his poverty. And that's how we come to Almighty God. We are so broken. We are so crippled. We are helplessly, habitually a sinner. And we can't do anything about it. No amount of self-help books. No amount of counseling. No amount of therapy. There is nothing that can change the fact that we are helplessly, habitually a sinner and we deserve hell. Except this. Jesus Christ came to rescue us. Amen. And he delivers us from that. What an amazing mission Jesus came on. Would you agree with me? It's the greatest mission of all, of all mankind, right? But listen to these words from the Lord Jesus Christ himself in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 14 and verse 12. You ready? Listen to the words of Jesus. I'm going to quote it to you from the old King Jimmy, okay? Here we go. Ready? Truly, truly, I say unto you, he that believeth in me the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Lord. Now, think about that. Jesus is saying that the work of the church is the very same thing as his work. Really? Jesus, you came to heal the brokenhearted? Yes, but I'm sending the church to heal the brokenhearted. Jesus, you came to give recovery of sight to the blind? Yes, but I'm sending the church to give recovery of sight to the blind. Look at, look at this next slide. This is amazing. It's the same as Jesus. Jesus said, the work that I do shall you do also, and greater works than these shall you do, because I go to my Father. Now, I want you to think about that, church. That the purpose of the church and the mission of the church is to do exactly the same work that Jesus was doing. Now think about that. Think about what that means. And when he says the church, he's not talking about just the preachers. Yeah, and I think that's, that's how, how most Christians think of it. Well, yeah, yeah, the preachers, they're supposed to do that. <clears throat> He didn't say, truly, truly, I say unto you, all the preachers that believe in me, the works that I do, they'll do also in greater work. That's not what he said. He said, whosoever believeth in me. So if I were to ask right now, everyone in the room that believes in Jesus, will you please stand? Okay, what, what would that do in the room? All of you would stay seated because you go, I'm not letting you do that to me. (laughs) See whether, but here's the thing. If you believe in Jesus, that scripture is talking about you. You are supposed to do the works that Jesus did. Lord. So I want you to close your eyes for a moment and I want you just to think about what that means about you personally. You are supposed to do the works that Jesus did. You, sir. Maybe you're a rancher. Maybe you're a farmer. Maybe you're a construction worker. Maybe you're a machine operator. 
Maybe you're a work hand. It's not what your natural employment is. It's who Jesus Christ says you are and what your work is for his kingdom. Sis, let me speak to you for a minute. Maybe you're retired and you're a homemaker and your big thing every year is getting your canning done. Maybe you're a secretary or you're a dental assistant. Maybe you are a word processor. Maybe you operate machinery for ConAgra. Maybe you drive school bus. Or you're a teacher. It's not what your natural career is. It's your identity in Jesus Christ. And it's the words of Jesus to you that because you believe in me, your job is to do the works that I did. That's amazing to think about, isn't it? It's amazing to think about. And can I tell you, he doesn't give you a retirement age. Amen. Oh, I'm 75 now. Okay, church, you need to be doing that. Ah, you are the church. You're still living and breathing and you believe in Jesus. You're the church. And the church goes wherever you go. So when you arrive at work tomorrow morning, God's church is there. Because you're there and you're the church. It's not this building. This building could be anything. This building could be a machine shop. The only reason it's a church building is because the church gathers here. We are what make this a church. The church is you. Are you being the church? Are you doing the work that Jesus said we're supposed to be doing? How in the world is that even possible? I'm glad you asked. Look at this next slide. Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Christo, word anointed. And its basic meaning in in classical Greek writing, it meant to pour oil on something or to rub with oil, okay, To, uh, to anoint. It also was used in classical Greek writing about setting an officer in place, whether it's a military officer or a city officer. Or a leader in a nation. To appoint to an office, okay? That's what it meant. Now, in scripture, it took on a whole new meaning when it talked about Yahshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. In the Greek, he would be Jesus Christ. Jesus the Anointed One. And Jesus is saying, I want you to know I'm here to do this work because Almighty God has anointed me with the holy oil of heaven, Holy Spirit, and he has appointed me to office. He has sent me in office to do this work. Amen? Amen. That's what Jesus was saying. That's why Jesus could do the work. The holy anointing oil of heaven was upon him and he had been appointed to that office to do that. Watch this. Go to the next slide for me, please. Watch what happens in Revelation chapter 1, 5 to 6. Would you like to turn there with me? I want us to read this one. So rather than quoting it to you, I would like us to read it together in Revelation 1, 5 and 6. Holler amen when you get there. Amen. 
Okay, here we go. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the, of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Say it. Amen. Amen. Did you see that? He has appointed you kings and priests. You're anointed. Amen. Amen. You're set in office. Well, pastor, I just can't do very much for God. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, so you're going to agree with that lie from the enemy? Why would you do that? Jesus says you're appointed. Why would you agree with the enemy who would keep you living in the less? Who would keep you living beneath your privilege? Who would keep you underachieving as a child of Almighty God? We are talking in this series about living the kingdom of God 24-7. And a part of living that kingdom, the only way you will live that kingdom is when you come into agreement with God and what he says about you and who he says you are. And he says, I've placed you in office as a king and priest in my kingdom rise up and be who I've appointed you to be Mm -mm. but see when we deny that then we can live in irresponsibility And, and, and our neighbor next to us who's walking in real bondage and and a tragic life we're not responsible for them. We got to get a hold of the preacher and get the preacher there because he's the one that God called. And, and there's a Greek word for that it's called balanos. Okay, I made it up. But we're appointed. We're anointed. The other reason that we're anointed is because of what it says in Romans. By the way, let me, let me stop. Matthew 16, 18, in case you're going, well, it says that in that scripture, but that's the only place in the Bible. No. Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Listen, I give you the keys of the kingdom, and whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loose in heaven. Jesus is saying, I've appointed you, and I have given you the authority of that appointment. Amen. Amen. Mm, Wow. Oh, I could preach right there for a long time, but we'll go on. Romans 8, verses 9 to 11, says that if we have not the Spirit of Christ, we're none of His. So if we don't have the Holy Spirit living in us, we're not born again. If we're born again, Holy Spirit lives within us. By the way, let me me touch... This is another little dessert. I'm not even charging you for this. Just a little dessert. Every major Christian doctrine is meant to be experiential. Okay? Okay? We believe in one God eternally existing in three persons. Namely, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay? Major Christian doctrine. But we're supposed to experience that. Jesus said, when he said, I'm going to pray the Father and he'll send you another comforter, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Listen to what he said. He said, in that day ye shall know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. Amen. That's all experiential. We're supposed to experience a personal relationship with the Trinity, with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You get it? How about about the, the, the doctrine of redemption? That all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That there's none righteous. No, not even one. 
The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the just theology. We're supposed to experience that. We're supposed to experience the washing and the cleansing that makes us a new creation, being born again. Amen? Not just doctrine, but experience it. How about the doctrine of sanctification? That's not just doctrine. We're supposed to live holy. That's just it. We're supposed to live holy. (laughs) That's right. Not just a good idea, live holy. The Ten Commandments aren't ten good ideas or ten suggestions. They're heavenly commandments that are still in force right now, today. Okay? (laughs) Come on. We're supposed to be experiencing, every major Christian doctrine is supposed to be experienced. Including the doctrine that when you're born again, Holy Spirit lives in you. And so inside of you, he can create the fruit of the Spirit. Amen. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, right? Okay. But listen, and he says, that same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, if he dwells in you, he that raised Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies Amen. by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. So many, so many theologians quote that scripture and point to the great resurrection. And I say to you, yes, that's talking about the great resurrection. But that's not just talking about the great resurrection. It's talking about living resurrection life right now by the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Come on. He's in you. Live resurrection life. Amen. But I want you to notice Jesus didn't say, the spirit of the Lord is in me, and he has anointed me. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Well, why is that significant? Because in Luke chapter 24, Jesus said to his disciples... Look, I've given you the great commission. Go and take the gospel to the world. But he said, but wait in Jerusalem until you are clothed with power from on high. And he used these words, the promise of the Father. Okay, what's he talking about? Acts chapter 1 verses 4 to 5. Explain it. But wait until you have received the promise of the Father. Same wording. Did you get it? Same wording as in Luke. Wait until you've received the promise of the Father. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Holy Spirit in you, Holy Spirit upon you. When we baptize people in water and we bring them up here into the baptistry, we don't get them down there in the water and then say, open your mouth and pour the water into them. (laughs) What do we do? We immerse them into the water in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and lift them out again. Amen? Amen. And the difference between being born again when the Holy Spirit comes in you and being baptized in the Holy Spirit is when the Lord Jesus Christ takes your life and immerses you into the Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit is upon you. Not just in you, upon you. Why? 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 Well, the grammar of, the, of that, uh, the meaning, the definition of that Greek word might help you understand what Jesus is talking about. It's the Greek word baptizo. Obviously, our word baptism is simply a transliteration of that word. Not just a translation, but a transliteration. We took the same Greek word and we, we made it in English. Baptism, baptizo. Well, how was it used historically and in classic Greek? And what was the meaning of that word baptizo? It was used two ways. First of all, it was used in the foundry. 
where they were working with metal and they would put it in the fire and they would heat it red hot and then put it over the anvil and they would hammer it. And after they'd hammered it, they would baptize it in oil. Take it out again, heat it in the fire until it was red hot. Take it and hammer it and then baptize it in oil. Why? They were tempering it. They were making it strong. So when they had that sword to go into battle, it's not just going to break easy. It is, it is hard. And they can sharpen it. Are you tracking with me? Yeah. Baptized. So that it strengthens the fiber of your life. He not just lives in you. He is strengthening the fiber of your life. But there was another meaning. It was used in the garment industry. For baptizing garments. They would take the garment made of the wool and it was it was woven and there was the there was the fabric and it was it was the plain color of the wool, but they would take that and they would baptize it in the dye. And they would leave it in the dye until every fiber of that fabric had, was, was covered with that dye and they would lift it out. They had baptized that garment in the dye. And what God wants to do is not just have the Holy Spirit living in you, making you a new creation. He wants to take your life and baptize you into the Holy Spirit so that every fiber of your being is saturated with Holy Spirit. Why? Jesus answered that question in Acts 1.8. And ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Yes. Nergamia. Energy. The energizer bunny. <laughs> he wants you to be energized by Holy Spirit. Not just Holy Spirit developing the fruit of the Spirit and the character of Almighty God in you. Yes, he wants that. That is not to be minimized. Holy Spirit in you developing the character of Almighty God in you so that you are living with integrity, so that you are living the Christian life authentically. Yes, but even more so, he wants you to have the divine power of Almighty God working through you so that you, the church, can do the same works that Jesus Christ did. And that's what he meant when he said, because I go unto my Father. What's going to happen, Jesus? When I go to the Father, I'm going to pray him and he's going to send you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it it, it neither knows him nor has seen him. But ye know him for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Both in you and upon you. Do you notice Jesus said both of them there? In you and upon you. He wants it both ways. We got a job to do, church. Anyone, anyone here just sick and tired of the devil beating up God's people? Anybody tired of that? You, 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 you tired of that yet? Tired of being harassed? Tired of the enemy just beating up on your family. And anybody here sick and tired of seeing our communities from Echo to Boardman, from Stanfield to Irrigan? Anybody sick and tired of seeing domestic violence, alcoholism, drug addiction just tearing our families apart? Anyone sick of that yet? You can do something about it. You've got the power of Almighty God. You can do something about it. But see, the church has, has adopted this philosophy that we're just to be here and let them see it and they'll want it. Baloney. Yeah, we do want them to see it. We want to live it authentically so they can see it. But can I tell you, they didn't just see that Jesus was an authentic man of God. They said these words about him. Gosh, who has ever spoken like this man? Where did he get this authority? But he didn't just do that. He didn't just speak it and live it before them. He stopped 
by blind Bartimaeus and gave him back his sight. He went to the girl that had died. He went to the and raised her from the dead. Come on. Come on. He did more than just live it and speak it. He brought the power of God into their life. Amen. Authentic power of the living God. I had the amazing privilege three weekends ago now. A man who was on staff with me from 1984 to, two, to 1990. He's in heaven celebrating with Jesus right now. He was 84 years old. Bob had been called into ministry in the 1950s, but he really felt like he was supposed to complete his career and take it to the people. When I first met Bob, we we were planting a new church and one Sunday morning he came in and dragging six people along with him. I I learned that that was Bob. And these six people were attending a Bible study in his home. Some of them had just received Jesus and some of them were still, still struggling with the idea of giving their life to Jesus. But they were with him. And all, all of them got saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit. God just working in their life. But Bob and Erlene were amazing, amazing. He had, he had 20 acres on the Sock River up by Darrington, Washington. And, and he called it God's Acres. And he, he made it into a camp, and he would have family camps up there and weekend camps. And, and it was the whole point was to get people there, to get them saved, to get them baptized in the Holy Spirit, and to pray healing and miracles for them. This guy could pray healings and miracles like nobody you've ever seen. I, I lost count of how many cancer patients in the hospital left the hospital cancer-free. Not because they'd gone through surgery. The surgery had been canceled. One Thursday night, we had our midweek Bible study on Thursday nights. And, and uh, one Thursday night, we, we had a packed house like we always did. And, and, and at the end of, of the Bible study, I was down front praying with people. And here came this couple I'd never seen before uh, in person. I knew he was a city council member of Lacey, Lacey, Washington, where the church was that we were planning. Because I'd seen him there when we had done some conditional use permits and stuff. So I knew who he was. I just had never personally met him. And he came up and, and uh, he was Roman Catholic. He attended St. Martin's College, right? Uh, St. Martin's Church right across the street from us. And, uh, and he said, he said uh, Father, I've heard that you pray for people and they get healed. Uh, would you pray for me? I have cancer. And I said, we would be honored to pray for you. And here's, here's Bob Miller right here standing with me, as always, working in the altar, helping me. And, and uh, he pulled up his sleeve, and here's this big old cancer on his arm, tumor on his arm. And so we prayed for him, and that cancer disappeared. <laughs> Two weeks later, he went to God's Acres with Bob and her lead Miller and got saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit. Just rocked his world. Bob was, a, was still a career man at that time. He hadn't, he hadn't retired from his career yet. He later retired from his career and began holding evangelistic meetings on Native American uh, reservations around the Pacific Northwest, and and he he, he had his he had his uh, uh, private license for flying, and he also had his float plane license, and he had a float plane because there were some of the Indian nations you could only get into by float plane or by or by boat, and so he would go there, and he looked for places that had never had a church, and he would go in and hold crusades and establish churches. But this was when Bob was still in his career. He hadn't retired yet. He was a businessman. He owned his own business. And I'm I'm sharing that with you because I want you to catch a vision. You're a businessman. You're a businesswoman. You're working. But first and foremost, you are a child of the living God. You are a king and priest unto your God. 
and that business career is only God's way of getting you into the mission field. And he wants you to go into that mission field with the authority and the power of the Holy Spirit. If you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit, why not? Well, I'm not sure it's for me. It's a promise of God. Why wouldn't you want one of God's promises to you? It's a gift of God. It's another gift from God that he wants you to have in your life. Why? Not just so you can speak in tongues. By the way, the whole point of him giving you speaking in tongues is because Holy Spirit will pray through you the will of the Father when you don't know how to pray. That's the whole point of having our spiritual language. It's not just so we babble in some kind of of silly gibberish. It's a heavenly language that God gives you that you can pray and you can pray a miracle. Okay, we're going to wrap this up. Go with me, if you would, please, to the Gospel of Matthew chapter... 17. I, I want to I tell you two stories, and then we're going to read Matthew 17. So go in your scripture to Matthew chapter 17. Here's the first story. It's recorded in both the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11. Matthew, chapter 21, Mark, chapter 11. And and here's the story. Jesus is in his last seven days of earthly ministry. And he is under examination. He is the Passover lamb in Jerusalem being examined by the priests. And he is he has ended one of his days and he's gone. He's he's staying in Bethany, which is over the Mount of Olives, just over the Mount of Olives. He's staying there and then he's coming into Jerusalem each day. And this next morning he comes back in and he's hungry and he sees this fig tree and it's got leaves but no fruit. And 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 Jesus curses the fig tree. He goes in, comes back, and the next morning they come back by that fig tree and it's dead. And the disciples marvel because it's dead. And Jesus said, look, I'm telling you, that if you have faith and you believe, you can say to this mountain, be removed and be cast in the sea and it will be done. If you have faith, if you have faith, In Matthew chapter 17, it's recorded Jesus going to the Mount of Transfiguration. And he comes back down from the mountain. And as he's on the mountain, this man brings his demoniac son to the disciples. And they can't deliver him. And Jesus comes and he goes, oh, how long do I have to be with you, unbelieving generation? He casts the demon out. He heals the boy. And later his disciples come and go, Lord, why couldn't we do that? See, they knew they were supposed to. They knew they were supposed to. But they couldn't. And they go, how come? And Jesus said, because you lacked faith. But if you have faith, you can say to this mountain, be thou removed and be cast into the sea. Now, look at verse 20 with me, would you please? Because of your unbelief. For assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here and to there, and it will move. All oh, those next words. Do they really say what they say? Do they really say what they say? Those of you that have your scripture open, do they really say what they say? You will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. 
We want to stop there. That's, I, I hear people say that. Say, well, you can save this mountain, be moved, it'll be moved. And they stop there. Jesus didn't stop there. And nothing will be impossible for you. So they give the death sentence. He's got moments. They bring in the bereavement cart. There's no hope. Oh, but they were talking to the wrong crowd. They were talking to a group of men and women who believed in Jesus. And so the work that Jesus does, they were about to do. And they called on others who believed in Jesus because they knew they believe in Jesus and they will pray and this mountain will be removed and nothing is impossible when the child of God believes. Do you believe? Yes. When I was 21, I was told I would be an invalid the rest of my life. That was in February 1970. In June, we were going to be married. And I knew I was called to preach. And I, I wheeled my wheelchair into the men's room because I could pray in there. I was in this, it was a military hospital and I was in an open bay with I don't know how many other guys. And, and to get a load so I could pray, I would wheel my wheelchair into the men's room and I, and I would pray in there. And I'm in there and I pray. I said, God, if I have to preach it from this chair, I'm still going to preach. But I know you're bigger than that. October of that year, Steve Brock came to our home church to do revival meetings. He didn't know me. He had never met me. And I go up for prayer and he lays his hands on me. And there was a power that came on me. I was like a jumping jack. It's like I was on a pogo stick. Boom, 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 boom. All over the front of that building. Boom, 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 boom. When I got done, and that was the power of God. I wasn't doing that. That was just the power of God going through me. When I got done, I started doing deep knee bends, and I was, wow. And I was completely healed. I had medical documentation. I was completely healed. A disease that there is no cure from. Rheumatoid arthritis. I could, I could, my knees were mush. I could move my kneecaps around to the back of my legs. Wanda knows. She saw that night before we went to the meeting I was sitting on the side of the bed I was pulling my pants on I was rubbing my knees and my legs were just like mush and I pulled my pants on I said to her tonight's my night nothing is impossible We believe with God all things are possible. I know you believe that. But do you believe that because you believe in Jesus and Holy Spirit lives in you and you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you have the anointing of Almighty God. Anointing. A divine impartation of supernatural power that enables an ordinary person to do an extraordinary task. so blessed that you join us online today for more resources on how you can grow your relationship with jesus christ visit us online at www.winacity.com if you would like to speak with someone about your relationship with jesus christ or would like prayer you can contact us at 541-567-4486 or email us at info at